what you're touching on is that emotional manipulation and and the idea of there's this stated expectation and it's worded in such a way that disagreement or another opinion is shut down before it's allowed to take root. Yeah, I can see that. And and I cannot remember the stinking clinical name for that dynamic. So that thingy for now, because this <laughs> that was very professional. I better write right? that down. Right. That thingy. That thingy. Um, I'm going to use that and the thingamajig and the doohickey and the what's it called. And yeah, I've got all kinds of words. Call it. Right. Yep. Yep. That's me. But <laughs> one of the things that really stands out to me is that this is a pretty common way that we as Mormons go about communicating um, is is this is the idea. And because I know I'm right and because I'm not open to another perspective and because there really isn't an allowance for growth or learning outside of our box, we tend, I used to for sure, I probably still do, I don't notice it as much, um, but I do still catch myself. And I notice you doing it. You, ha- you were actually doing it this, this morning when you were talking to your brother on the phone and kind of working him through some things. And I'll give you an example of it, but it's like, I'm, I'm making this statement, but I'm not leaving room for disagreement. And I wish I could remember that word that I'm looking for. So, Hey, there's anybody else clinical out there, please define (laughs) this because I am drawn a blank. But in the sense, like when you were talking to your brother, you were saying, you were saying things as fact and then saying right to him, but there wasn't a lot of allowance for him to be like, no, I don't agree with that because then that yeah. throws off the point that you're trying to make. And you're right. It is a mind trick um, in the sense of once you have this, you can't, you can't because that message of what he's not saying is, and if you do, there's something wrong with you right. and so it that sets us message, up yeah. for receiving that as a message of shame and that's because the statement is basically he's taking a statement making it fact even though there's no way to have tangible evidence to place it as fact and so when we get and into then manipulating my behavior because of the fact that he just created right Right. He says, this is the fact, and now you need to behave because this is the fact and how I'm seeing it. Yeah. And then you talked about something that you had said earlier before we started recording that really got me is you're like, and then he gets all emotional. And I think that that emotion is manipulative. And, and I mean, again, whether or not he's doing it intentionally, that's, that's, uh, it's, it's, I'm not here to judge his intentionality. One of the things that I do in clinic is, you know, reality based thinking or something that we call Socratic questioning, where we start to poke holes in somebody's perceived reality because the reality is based on non tangible, non concrete fact. Um, So, for example, if you don't obey all of these rules and do all of these things, you can't live with your family again forever in heaven. Now, number one, I don't think there's anything that shows up like that in the scriptures that that they would that they use as part of their um, correlated study. But it's been said over and over and over again. So it's, it's this fear tactic, but it sounds really pretty on the outside. You know, if you do all the right things and you check all these boxes, then you get to live with your family in heaven again. Well, the thing is, is that give me something concrete. What evidence do you have to demonstrate that that is a statement of fact? And the answer is nothing other than the words of people claiming to be prophets. What fact do you have what's tangible that you have that joseph smith saw god and jesus in the um sacred grove or the forest in palmyra new york um we don't other than the things that he said and the recordings that we have from him but it's all 
conjecture. Now, does that mean it's not true? No. No, of course not. But it not. also doesn't mean that it is true. True, And so when we end up basing our entire belief system off of the feelings that we have and the statements of people where there's no evidence to ground us into reality-based thinking, we run the risk of this like living outside of reality. Now, I know that I'm not saying that Mormons do that. Some Mormons absolutely do and it I'm gets sure. them in trouble like so yeah lots of people do for example like the Lafferty brothers you know Mason something that you and I talked about when we watched the um the under, under the, the banner, banner of, of heaven, heaven s- series was that on Netflix or was it on Hulu uh, I don't even remember where we ended up watching I thought it was it. on HBO but I don't remember anyway anyway well, under the banner of heaven yeah, we'll it was get terrific it, we'll, well yeah, yeah we'll put that in the show notes and, and whatnot so you can find it if you're still looking for it but we watched that and then one of the things that we commented on was how a lot of Mormons were really angry and saying this does not represent the Mormon church and you and I looked at that and we were like well duh because it's not a representation of the Mormon church. It's right. a representation of how the Lafferty brothers perceived the teachings of the Mormon church. Right. And that perception, the way that they were doing things, was completely based on the teachings that were in some pamphlet and some of the things that had been said by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young a million years ago that were taken, I'm going to say really literally, and, and they kind yeah. of, in a sense, they lost their moral compass and they, they definitely lost their humanity because they were no longer in touch with reality. And when I say that, I don't mean like schizophrenic, paranoid, hallucinating out of touch with reality but rather they were disconnected with the world around them. And I think one of the concerns that I have with members of the church is because they do tend to live in these isolated communities and they don't like to let anything non-Mormon in because it's all perceived as a threat, there's a huge risk for living in this alternate reality that isn't founded in evidentiary evidentiary fact or tangible things it's all based on feelings and you know experiences but i'm interpreting my experiences through the lens that the church has given me and so when we come back to statements like what you're talking about here that the crowning characteristic of love as defined by jeffrey r holland is loyalty If we step away from that and we then look at, okay, what is our linguistic and our anthropological and our relational and these other pieces, what is, what is that definition of love? And I think you're going to come up with two very different and distinct definitions. But one of the things that cults like to do and something that, um, is it Luna Lindsay Corbden? I think that's her name. I need to double check that in her book, Recovering Agency, one of the things that she talks about and one of the things that Steve Hassens has talked about in that cult research is that they change the terminology of certain things so that they say something, but they shifted the the meaning of the word to mean something else in order to bring their point home. And that is a manipulation tactic um, because loyalty might definitely when you love somebody you might be loyal to them but i would not say that the definition of love or the crowning characteristic of love is loyalty and therefore then obedience i just i don't i just don't see that and so there's there's kind of some play on words here that he's taking advantage of we would love to invite you to join our facebook group unpacking mormonism and other religious trauma on facebook so that we can have some open dialogue and foster a community of support thanks so much